This is the second experiment using the analog discovery in an electronics uh, communications lab environment. It follows on the, uh, the, the earlier video uh, about pulse width modulation or pulse amplitude modulation that uh, I did on the analog discovery a, a month or so ago. And this uh, uh, experiment is uh, one of a series that comes from this lab manual. Uh, it's the lab manual for uh, modern electronic communications by Beasley and uh, Miller. And I'm using the analog discovery in this case to generate a sine wave and a triangle wave for the experiment, which I will show you in just a minute, the, uh, the circuit. Uh, it's on the left-hand breadboard here. There are two breadboards wired together. On the left is the uh, multiplexer, that is the, uh, the, the sender in this particular system, and on the right is the demultiplexer, which I'll, we will talk about in, uh, in the second segment of this video. On the screen is the output of the multiplexer. This is a sync pulse that is generated every multiplex cycle. This is channel 1, this is channel 2, and this is channel 3, and I'm only using three channels. There actually would normally be a channel here, and a channel here, and a channel here, and a channel here. I'm skipping those so that these stand out better in the experiment. So it's basically we're doing a three-channel multiplex with the third channel being a uh, square wave or a low-level uh, DC signal. This is a uh, triangle wave, which we will look at in a second. This is a sine wave. These are both at one kilohertz. So the basic idea is you generate a sync pulse each cycle. Then you select channel 1, then you move on and select channel 2, and you select channel 3. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the uh, circuit. And here is the screen of the computer that I have the analog discovery connected to. The uh, At the top up here is the uh, sine wave, uh, and in a minute I'll show you the parameters over here and I'll zoom in a little better. This is the sine wave, and this is the triangle wave being uh, used in the multiplexer. Now let's come over here and zoom in a little bit. I have this set to the arbitrary waveform generator 1, AWG1, and the uh, signal that's selected is a sine wave at 1 kilohertz with an amplitude of 3 volts. You notice at the top here, that's 5 volts, that's maximum. And then in this little window, you see 3 volts. Another way you can tell that is down here is 0, and this is 5 at the top. So this slider is at 3 volts. And the offset is right now at 0 volts. Now, let's talk a little bit about the circuit and the, uh, and the breadboard. Here is the multiplexer circuit. Up in the upper left-hand corner is a ring oscillator made up of three sections of a uh, 4001 CMOS uh, uh, NOR gate. The, the capacitor provides the timing, and the resistors provide positive feedback that causes this circuit to oscillate. In this particular case, I have it set to oscillate at about 10 kilohertz. That signal is then fed to this 4029, which is simply a uh, binary counter set to count in the up mode, and that's what all these grounds are doing here, and the and the, the VCC and the others, these are held high. I'll show you what that circuit looks like in just a second. That feeds into a 4051. Down here in the original experiment, an 8038 was used, and if you looked at my PAM experiment video, you know that there was a piece of equipment that I constructed a prototype of that used to be used for this part. And it generated a sine wave and a uh, 
triangle wave, that is being substituted for in this particular application by the analog discovery. This is a 4029. It's basically a counter. There is a preset enable, then uh, a, an up-down count uh, determines whether the counter go, counts up or counts down. A binary decade uh, input deciding whether it does a binary or a decade, and then a clock. I have this set to permanently up count as a binary counter. And the outputs, I'm only using the first three uh, outputs. These are the three outputs feeding the multiplexer. This is a block diagram of the 4051 multiplexer. On the left, you have logic level conversion. And that is, uh, so for example, if you're using TTL on this side and CMOS uh, signals being multiplexed, the level converter basically uh, makes up the difference and causes the binary uh, decoder to properly switch these CMOS switches on the far right. And then the basic operation is as each of these lines goes high, and there are eight of them, it selects one of these inputs and connects that input to the common output. Because CMOS is bilateral, in other words, the signal can flow in or in the output and out of the input and vice versa, this is a bilateral switch, and so you can actually use this to reverse the operation and to demultiplex, and we'll see that when we get to the demultiplexer. Now you probably can understand a little better what we're showing here on the oscilloscope. This is the sync pulse, and we generate that by creating a fixed level for this input. We're using uh, a bias point, DC bias point, for this input at about two and a half volts, and then the uh, sine and square wave inputs are going to the other two. So basically it's a four channel uh, multiplexer, the way it's set up. You might regard this as channel zero, which we're using as a sync pulse. That's that steady uh, voltage. Uh, it's set to about four volts. It's deliberately set higher than all these others so that it's easy to trigger both the oscilloscope and later when we use the demultiplexer, we can separate this pulse from all the others simply by triggering on this upper area. In other words, it's always taller than all the other signals. If you're familiar with NTSC television, that also worked that way. The sync pulse was always blacker than black, it was the term they used in some cases, which meant that it was the it was the tallest signal or the highest signal in the video waveform and that enabled it to be separated out. So we'll talk more about that when we talk about the demultiplexer. Now let's look at what where we're deriving this signal. That signal is coming off of the 4051 at pin 3, which is the common output or common input output since it's bilateral. And that over here is where we have the oscilloscope probe connected. This is the 4051 that's, using, that's used for multiplexing and we have it connected to pin 3. This is the 4029, the counter, and then to the left of that is the uh, 4001 that we're using as a ring uh, oscillator. Now let's talk about how we demultiplex this signal. The signal that you saw on the oscilloscope is coming in on the left here. It's, it's going to two locations. One is to a comparator and the other is to a 2907 which we'll talk about in a minute. The comparator turns the signal into a binary basically cleans it up, and the purpose of that is to generate a clean reset pulse for the 4029. 
the problem with having a second counter is you've got to not only get it synchronized in terms of when it changes state, but you also have to synchronize all the states. In other words, it has to be in state zero when the counter on the multiplexer is also in state zero. So the way we do that is we sense every pulse coming in. We compare it to a level. One of those pulses, the synchronizing pulse, is bigger than the others. And so we set this level so that the output of this is only a one or only a pulse when the synchronizing pulse is what's being received. We then clean that up with a 4001. It's the fourth part of the 4001, although in my particular implementation I have used two 4001s so I can put them on separate boards. Then that signal is used to reset the uh, demultiplex counter. The clock for the demultiplex counter is derived from a 2907. I'm not going to talk about that very much. The reason is that while this is the way the experiment was originally designed and, and I've implemented it this way, the 2907 was really, it's an automobile tachometer chip. I suggest that if you uh, want to build this uh, particular circuit yourself, and it's it's more for demonstration purposes, you wouldn't, uh, you can actually buy uh, integrated chips that do all of this in one chip today, but the purpose of this is to demonstrate how you might construct such a chip. 2907 is not really a good implementation. I would use a zero crossing detector there instead if I were designing this, but since I'm implementing a lab design from another, uh, from a book that's being used, I've, I've used the 2907 again. But at any rate, that causes the 4029 to count in sync with the uh, counter in the multiplexer, and then its outputs are applied to another 4051 that is essentially hooked up backwards. In other words, its pin 3 is the input signal. And so it is connecting pin 3 to the inputs. If you remember, The, the common input-output gets connected through these bilateral switches to a series of pins here. And in the case of the demultiplexer, the signal actually flows from pin 3 and comes out on one of these pins. To reduce noise, uh, we have terminated a number of pins in 10K resistors, and we have terminated the output in this case with 1K resistors, uh, I'm sorry, with 10K resistors that you see down here. In other words, there are jumpers right here. Once again, that is mainly just so that the counter and the demultiplexer don't generate too much noise. Now I have connected the oscilloscope to the channel 1 output of the 4051. And right now it's only connected to a 1K resistor to ground and I've connected it to channel 2 of the oscilloscope. I've readjusted the time scale to show this a little more clearly. This is the sync pulse. In other words, the pulse that's higher than all the rest. This is channel 1. This is channel 2, but we're only connected to the channel 1 output. And because it's a demultiplexer, it only selects one channel. And in this case, this output selects channel 1. That is a sine wave. And you may notice that it's only a portion of a sine wave. But the sine wave that is being multiplexed is being received on the demultiplexer, channel 1. Similarly, channel 2 and channel 3 will do the same thing. And of course, you can have as many channels as you want. One problem, of course, is as you increase the number of channels, the number of samples per channel becomes the limiting factor. If you try to multiplex a bunch of signals, then you have to increase your sampling frequency or your multiplex frequency so that you still get enough samples per cycle for each channel.
I've now made two changes. One is to the output circuitry of the demultiplexer and instead of a 1K resistor or 10K resistor to ground that we had earlier, I'm using a low pass filter that is a, a 1K resistor and an integrating capacitor. They're not the exact values that are shown on this schematic. I don't use the same values for a number of reasons. One is because these experiments might be repeated out of the book and the book doesn't disclose, in fact that's part of the exercise, what the frequencies are and so on. I don't actually use the frequencies in the book. I change those uh, parameters just so people watching the video aren't tempted to use my results instead of their own results. Similarly, the signal frequency is not the same as the one in the book. For that reason, the capacitor that I'm using here, instead of being a 0.47 microfarad as is shown on the schematic, I said I made two changes. One change is that, that output network, and the other change is to the uh, horizontal sweep speed of the scope. The two traces are the same as earlier. In other words, this is the, uh, the output of the multiplexer. Remember, the highest level is the uh, uh, multiplex synchronizing pulse, and then there are three channels, one of which is a sine wave, one of which is a triangle wave. And you see the sine wave that's being recovered. And there's a lot of optimization that can be done in this, but the, the purpose of this is to illustrate the method, not to produce a working design that you might actually use in practice. What you see is, of course, the output of the multiplexer, but, but at a much different sweep speed. And then the sine wave. We have demultiplexed the input signal by recreating the clock using the uh, 2907, synchronizing the counter by using its, uh, its reset, and then using that synchronized counter to demultiplex using the same type of 4051 from four channels multiplexed into four output channels. In this case, I, I only have three connected because the fourth, remember, is the synchronizing pulse. And that contains no information other than timing. So this completes the time division multiplexing portion of using the analog discovery in electronics communications experiments. I hope this has been useful. If you're doing this experiment in a lab, uh, just remember that while I have reconstructed the, the uh, circuit and I have used comparable parameters, don't copy my results because I have deliberately changed frequencies and capacitor sizes and in a few cases resistor sizes so that the results I get, while functionally identical to the results you will get, they are not numerically the same. I hope that this will inspire you to try one of these uh, experiments, and I hope also that it will inspire you to use an analog discovery in some of the work that you are doing in place of arbitrary waveform generators and oscilloscopes. Now in this particular case I've continued to use the Tektronix oscilloscope and part of the reason is that frankly it shows up better on the camera than the computer screen particularly when it comes to waveforms uh, on an oscilloscope. But if you're using it yourself you'll find that the analog discovery will not only generate the waveforms but will also serve as a useful oscilloscope, two-channel oscilloscope, and we'll let you look at exactly the same thing that we've been looking at on the Tektronics. Once again, I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you in our next experiment.